Chancellor, Vice Chancellor, members of the Senate, and members of the UWA community, all of us ocean lovers, I'm sure. Um, it's a great privilege for me to have the opportunity to provide a bit of an address this evening um, around Australia's big blue. And I'm actually going to talk about two big blues. The obvious one, of, of course, is our oceans. And we're very fortunate living in Perth to have the beautiful Indian Ocean right off our doorstep. The other big blue I'm going to um, refer to, channeling my inner Aussie, is the big blue that we're having as a community about the best way forward to manage our oceans and ensure, ensure that they're healthy into the future. But I'm going to start first with the blue marble that we inhabit. 71% of the surface of this spinning globe is salt water. The ocean is the largest ecosystem on the planet. It controls our weather. It mitigates the impacts of climate change. Sting, when he sang every breath you take, nearly got it right. It's actually every second breath you take that comes directly from the oxygen produced by our oceans. The oceans also under, underpin our prosperity. In Australia alone, about $44 billion a year is generated from ocean-dependent enterprise. That's larger than our agricultural sector. And that number is estimated to reach $100 billion a year by 2025. The ocean is, however, under significant pressure. This is a map from the Gulf of Mexico, and it shows the nearly 4,000 oil and gas platforms that dot that area. And most of you will probably remember the Deepwater Horizon catastrophic oil spill um, that occurred in deep water in that region. We also increasingly crisscross our oceans with large boats. Um, these boats disturb wildlife. They cause collisions. They pollute. But they're an important part of our infrastructure. 75% of the goods that are exported from, Western, from Australia are from our island nation are by ships. We also seem delighted um, to fill our oceans with plastic that kills wildlife. Um, but it's not just the plastics that you can see. So all of you tonight who would have exfoliated for this gala event um, probably had plastic microbeads in the products that you used. They're also in your toothpaste, by the way. And these microplastic beads get into the food, food web in our oceans and cause devastating damage. Australia is not immune to these challenges. Despite our remoteness, we now have our first ever super trawler, which is busy vacuuming up fish in the southeast of Australia and having significant negative impacts on protected species like dolphins and whale sharks. Uh, we have extensive acreage in our northwest for oil and gas exploration, and our pollution problems from lost fishing gear in the north of Queensland are so significant that we now make art out of it. This is a basket woven from um, uh, lost fishing nets, ghost fishing nets. So, you know, we've got a few challenges in the ocean, and I was, but the interesting thing is I was uh, standing down at Redgate and Margaret River a couple of weeks ago, getting blown off by a howling southwesterly. I was looking out over this amazing ancient coastline and thought to myself, this is exactly the same view that the first Australians would have had 35,000 years ago. Sea level would have been a little bit different, but basically the same. And when the early explorers like Entrecasteau and so on came here, again, they would have looked out and seen the exact same thing on the surface that I get to look at and have the privilege to look at now. The main difference is that it used to be a larder. And when the boats came sailing down the coast, they were able to replenish their stores. But I know that if you go snorkeling, not on a day like this, <laughs> as an aside, the larder is empty. We have managed to strip up, can you guys hear me say? We have managed to strip out many of the animals that live on our oceans without even noticing because all we see is the surface. And in fact, fishing is the single greatest experiment that we've run on our oceans, apart from climate change. So this shows basically what's happened over the last um, 50 years. And I know that because I was born in 1965, which is 66, which is why I chose that first date. But basically through until 1995, every year we caught more and more fish from our oceans and removed more and more. In 1996, you guys are probably familiar with the term peak oil. Well, we hit peak fish. It's been declining ever since. Um, and we basically can't, our oceans can't sustain this. 
And how does this happen? This is an example from um, the Spanish, notorious hunters on the high seas. And in the 1950s, their footprint um, for fishing was basically in the North Atlantic and off the east coast of Canada. But by the 2000s, they'd spread their entire fishing fleet across the seas globally. Off of, they'd moved south from the North Atlantic where basically the fish were gone, off the coast of Africa and into this Western Indian Ocean. And this expanding footprint is one of the main reasons that we've hit peak fish. We saw it going up because we fished further and further, but there's basically no ocean left to go to. The one little irony of the, that map on the bottom is that you can see off Canada, they're no longer fishing there much at all. And it's possibly because the resources are so depleted, but it's more likely that our fisheries ministers have a history of arresting the Spanish on the high seas for illegal fishing. So that's um, where, where we're at. What does that mean for ocean wildlife? If you look across any group of species, whether it's turtles, birds, sharks, fish, we're looking at depletions on the order of 60 to 95 percent. The average um, that we think for the oceans as a whole, and I promise this isn't going to be all depressing, there is a solution coming soon. So the challenge is, the recognition though, is that we've basically lost 80 percent of the animals in our oceans. We've just caught them. So could I get everybody to stand up for a moment from your chairs? This is the audience participation. All right, so right now, it's 1966, the year I was born, and we have a full ocean, chockers with fish, chockers with wildlife. It's before industrialized fishing started. Now it's 2016. Could two people stay standing at each table and the rest sit down? A bit of negotiation, you need two to stand. <laughs> This, this is actually the question of who's the herring, right? Because the first ones, the first ones to disappear are the apex predators and the sharks. So if you're still standing, you're a herring. Um, but but more, no, no, stay standing. More to the point, you're probably pretty lonely. If you look around the room, you're saying, where, where, where did everybody go? How am I going to get lucky so that I can contribute to the next generation? So you guys are probably all right. <laughs> But even worse, for the eight of you or so that are sitting down, you've either been eaten, drowned in a net, killed by plastics, or merely thrown over the side of the boat as trash fish not worthy of being brought back to port. That's fundamentally what we've done. So Heron, you can sit down. So what to do? What to do? Where there's challenges, there are always solutions, and certainly UWA is about finding solutions. What we've seen in the last five to ten years is what we call mega marine parks. These are areas of our ocean territory internationally where we say, you know what, you don't get to fish everywhere. We're going to have some large marine parks that allow us to have refuges for this ocean wildlife. And the idea behind these is to halt at the least the declines and at best start to reverse them. On land, we recognize that we need national parks to preserve biodiversity, and indeed about 15% of our terrestrial estate is protected. Uh, the oceans have a way to go. There's only about 1% of our seas that are currently protected, but there's huge momentum behind this. And happily, whoop, shoot, happily, Australia is, at, is leading in this area. We were the first country to decide that we were going to take our entire exclusive economic zone. That's the um, area that goes from the coastline out to about 350 kilometers and set up a network of marine protected areas that are going to ensure that we have sustainable, um, happy, healthy oceans. So this is where the second big blue comes in. We're in the middle of a massive debate about what should we protect, how much should we protect, and is it going to make a difference? And Currently, just this week, the new Minister for Environment, Josh Frydenberg, has released a review. I should note that we've been doing this process since 1998. We've been involved with this. But he's released the report, and now we're going to go through more consultation to have a conversation about what do we protect and where. Now, how do we do that? Or why are we doing that? So the good news is that we know that marine parks work. 20 years of research from the Great Barrier Reef, from um, New Zealand, from Europe, 
has shown that if you close areas to fishing, you get more fish um, and they're bigger. And the great thing about being a fish is the most important fish in the ocean is the big old fat female. Now imagine being valued for being old and fat. <laughs> so what we're seeing in these marine parks is these, well I'm a biologist, we talk about sex too, right? So we'll get there. Um, so basically we know this, we've got years and years and years of evidence that marine parks work in the coast and that they then have benefits for tourism and fisheries. However, because we haven't had big blue marine parks before and because tuna and fish like that move around a lot more, we don't necessarily have the evidence yet because if you don't have a marine park, how can you collect data on your marine park? So we're at the forefront of trying to figure out how this works and what UWA has done, and here's where the research and innovation comes in, is we've created this super groovy little rig that's got two Go GoPros on it. GoPros, by the way, have transformed marine science. It's got two little GoPros on it, you drop it off the back of your boat, it floats with a bait, and the fish swim by and you count them. So I'm now going to show a video that, and I'm going to quit talking for a minute, to show a video that basically gets at the gist of how we do the work, where we do it, and what we see when we do the work. Thanks, Phil. Oops. Is that volume? Didn't go automatic. That's good. <laughs> That's bait. And that's Phil who's doing AB. <laughs> So even, even seabirds, um, and if you reflect back to that first slide I showed you about the various declines, we actually see most of those animals um, on our cameras. And to just give you a sense of the scale, um, the group has, has identified and counted some 30,000 individual fish over the last little while, so they are truly dedicated. The value of that video, um, before I go on to the last bit, is not just that it gives us the quantitative data so that we can understand the state of our marine environment, and look at how it changes um, through time and with protection, but it also is a little glimpse of what our marine environment actually looks like that most of us don't get to see. And if we're going to value our marine estate and want to protect it, we actually have to know what's in it. I never bothered talking during those things because nobody pays any attention because they're just watching the video. So, um, marine parks and the science that we do behind them are actually, I think, largely about a change of culture. So I wanted to share this clip from the Great Barrier Reef and then just talk about why that matters. Yes, everybody had the cringe moment, didn't they? You just sit there and go, ick, right? So in the 1960s, it seemed like an eminently reasonable thing to ride a, tur <laughs> to ride a turtle. Um, and I think the reason that it's so important for us to engage in this big blue about our big blue marine parks is that we are at significant risk of in 20 years from now 
saying, what were we thinking when we just extracted all of those animals out of the ocean and did little to, um, to stop that? So we want to avoid being turtle riders of the future. And in fact, the game that we really need to be focused on is replicating what we know from coastal areas into the big blue, where we can look forward to seeing um, an ocean as full of all those people. I won't ask you to stand up again, but an ocean that is as full of fish as it should be. The, um, just want to flag that this is a significant piece of work that we're doing at University of Western Australia. I wouldn't be able to do it without a wonderful team of very committed young people. And I would like to also flag that the university's commitment to having an Indian Ocean Marine Research Center and fostering uh, ocean research in this part of the Indian Ocean is absolutely fantastic. And with that, I shall close. And apparently, I'm taking questions. Michael? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>